Yesterday, on Facebook, I posted the title of my sermon. Anybody see that? That wants to admit it? You didn't see it? Okay. Um, I didn't, did I say, did anybody not see that? No, no, I didn't say that. So you saw it, Julie? What did it say? Do you remember what it said? Okay, let me try this again. What, what? Nice. Okay, that's, that's exactly wrong. That's what it's, I, I showed my wife, I said, here's my, here's my sermon title. She goes, okay, I said, what's it say? She said, my job description. I said, no, it says my Job description. So turn to the book of Job. <laughs> huh? She did see that. Pray for Julia's memory. <laughs> my Job description. Now, actually, I toyed with three different titles. I won't tell you what those titles were until the end, but I got to thinking about this. I've been thinking about this. I know I've preached out of the book of Job several times, but this is kind of a... You ever see those books? Um, what are they called? Um, books. No, okay, like uh, uh, Mechanics for Dummies or something like this. Okay, this is... Yeah, this is the book oh, of... Yes, absolutely. So when I say the book of Job for dummies, it's actually from a dummy. Okay, but book of Job troubles me. I know it has troubled a lot of people. Um, that you, you read it and it's like it drives you nuts. So I'm going to give you the briefest of briefest overviews of the book of Job. Just some simple lessons. I was going to call it lessons from Job or something like that. I think I've had a message like that. But this is, I, I, there's some thoughts in here that I've never had before, that I've never shared with you before. But it's, anyways, let me just read you a little bit. And out of Job chapter 1 and just a few verses to kind of kick it off. And then we'll, I'll share my points with you. So here it is. Verse 1, chapter 1, says, There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Was he perfect? No. What it means is he was mature, he was godly, he was a good guy. Okay. There were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and, and, and a very great household. He had a big house so that, his, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. He was pretty well off. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one uh, his day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. And for Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Then verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Satan answered, said, Lord, and answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? I'm going to stop there, right in the middle of this verse. But you know the story. If not, we'll talk about it for a second. And then I'll get into my little points. Talk about this thing about Job, all right? So let me pray. We'll get into this. Heavenly Father God, I do pray, Lord, that you'll bless this time right now, that you'll use it, and that you'll help us. Lord, this indeed is a, can be a troubling book. It's certainly different. It kind of stands out from everything else in the Bible, Lord. It kind of just kind of stands alone in a lot of ways. So much we don't know about it. And the stuff that we do know, Lord, it kind of leaves us scratching our heads sometimes. But I thank you for, Lord, just some of these thoughts that you've given me. And I pray that you'll use them, Lord, in, our, in each one of our hearts and lives, Lord, some reminders. So, God, again, we just commit this time into your hands and ask you to use it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so, if you're not familiar with the book of Job, 
it obviously talks about a guy who's a good dude. Now, this is supposed to be, I've heard, now, Bible scholars agree on this. I don't know where they get this. That the book of Job is actually the oldest book in the Bible. We're not even sure who wrote it. Um, it happened probably before the time of the patriarchs, before Abraham and those dudes. You know, um, that's what they say. Matter of fact, there's a couple of instances in here, a couple of passages where I think, personally, I think they're talking about, you're going to think I'm crazy. <clears throat> Dinosaurs. It mentions a, a creature called Behemoth and something called Leviathan. And if you look at their descriptions, it doesn't match anything that's around today. <clears throat> I personally believe that there were dinosaurs on the ark. I think that it was always, I'm just not that guy. I don't believe that there were in billions of years and all that stuff. I mean, there's always been time. Well, no, that's not true. God's always been around, but this earth's not that old, according to the Bible. I happen to choose to believe the Bible. But regardless, I think... You know, this is a pretty old book. Um, Job was a good dude, pretty well off. But then there was something that happened. It says that there was a day, there was a day, there was a day in the life of Job where it says that the sons of God presented themselves, angels, and Satan was amongst them. And the Lord said, have you thought about Job? Have you considered my servant Job? He's a good dude. And Satan said, you know, the reason why he's good is because you're, so, you're so good to him. You blessed him. Look, he's like the richest dude in the East. So you let me take away his stuff. We'll see how good of a guy he is. God said, okay. Took away all his stuff in a day. God said to Satan, what do you think now? Still praising me. He goes, that's because he's healthy. Oh, when I say he took away his stuff, he didn't just take away his stuff. He took away his kids, too. All his kids in one day died. Then and God said, he goes, well, he's only, he's only still praising you because he's healthy. He goes, take that away, too. Just don't kill him. So he did. And Job still didn't curse God. After that, we're kind of left with that conversation. No, no more of that anymore with, between God and Satan. But then it just, there's a whole, I, I, you read the first part. I'll be honest with you, the first part's easier for me to read, even though it's tough to see the stuff that happened to this dude. The middle part of the book I struggle with because it's mostly just conversations. He has four friends that show up, and at first they don't say anything. They just sit there. The Bible says for seven days they don't say a word. He's just sitting out in the yard scraping his boils with broken pottery. And they're just sitting there not saying nothing. They probably should have kept not saying nothing because when they started talking, they started saying stupid stuff. And so for the next several chapters, it's these guys talking to each other and they're saying, they're basically saying, you know what, you, know, it's probably this, you probably got sin in your life. And they're trying to help. I think they meant good. But it's, it's a tough read because it's like, well, how do you know what's right and what's wrong here? When they're talking... Because there's some good stuff in there, but then there's some stuff that's like, what, what, everything that they're saying isn't right. God tells, that, tells us that later, but it's like it's a tough, that part there I have a hard time wrapping my head around. Just conversations between dudes. And then God speaks up. A couple of chapters where God says, okay, it's my turn. And, and literally, literally God says to Job, all right, sit up, put your big boy pants on, it's my turn. And God talks. I love that part. Okay, because you don't have to wonder about what parts to take literally because it's all God talking then. And then you see the, the happy ending at the end. Okay, so it's like, what in the world? When you read that book, you come away going, huh. Then you go into Psalms and you try to forget about what you just read in Job. Let me give you just a few herald lessons from the book of Job. Number one. There's ten of these, by the way. I'll go through these rather rapidly. God notices how we live. He said, have you considered him? Have you? He said, I, I know everything about this guy. I watch him. Have you, Satan, have you considered him? He's, it says here, it says here, opening part of the book, it says he was perfect and upright, feared God and eschewed evil. God 
Notice is how we live, both the good and the bad. And it matters to God how we live. It matters. A lot of times we think that, I, I, I don't know if we, we would never say this, but I think the way we live sometimes, we think God doesn't notice stuff. He does. God notices how we live. Number two, <laughs> stuff happens behind the scenes that we don't know about. Job didn't know about this conversation. He didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. All he knew was that one day was a really, really bad day. He knew God was involved. But nobody told him. But stuff happens behind the scenes in our lives that we don't know anything about. You know, we try to figure that stuff out, and it's kind of, we'll get to that here in a minute, but this idea that there's stuff going on. When we talk about being in a spiritual warfare right now, that we, we don't see what's going on, but it's going on. We don't, man, I wonder if the Lord's going to let us see some of that stuff where uh, he protects us from different things or the things that he allows but stuff goes on behind the scenes that we don't know anything about. And, I wrote this down, we probably wouldn't understand it if we did know about it. But I'll be honest with you, I'm pretty sure, and maybe I'm wrong. No, nah, I don't think so. I'm pretty sure that the description here between this conversation between God and the devil is kind of the dumbed-down version, that it was way more involved than that. And also that God wasn't just like, you know, the devil said, well, do this. I'll do this. And God would be like, that's a good idea. No, God already knew. God allowed it for a reason. Um, it's a dumbed-down version. God was basically just giving us... The, the, it's, it's interesting to me that Job, when you... I don't even know why I'm saying this, but if you look up or study bibliology and the different groupings of books of the Bible that the book of Job is put in the class of what they call the, one of the poetic books. Okay, now don't think that that takes away from the factualness of it. And when I say that the, the conversation here that went on between God and the devil was the, probably the dumbed down version, it's because we don't see all the intricacies and God just give us a little flicker of information here about what went down in ways that we wouldn't understand if we did know. But just know, just think about this, that there's stuff behind, that happens behind the scenes that we don't know anything about. Number three, this is a big one. A lot of stuff happened bad to Job, okay? But not everything bad that happens to us is a punishment. God's not looking for opportunities to spank us. A lot of times some of the bad will happen in our lives and we think that we're being punished for something. Okay, that might be the case. When I say punished, I'm not talking about being judged by God and that God's looking to squish us. I'm talking about punished in the sense that I'm going to have to spank you. I'm going to have to spank you, son. The, the purpose of the chastening that God gives us or sends our way is to restore us to fellowship. Okay, but we don't see that here in Job's case. There wasn't, God, matter of fact, God had nothing but good stuff to say about it. I'm not saying that Job was perfect, but this wasn't, a, a, uh, this wasn't any chastening involved here. Everything that happens bad to us isn't because God's mad at us or that he's punishing us. Sometimes it's a test. Sometimes it's a trial. God's testing us. He's trying us. I wrote it this way because it's like, well, I already had two words that started with T, so I wrote this one. Sometimes it's just turbulence. Sometimes it's just the fact that we just live in a fallen world. But it's not always because we're being punished. Kind of keep that in the back of your mind. I don't know what it is you may be going through right now, but maybe you're kind of toying the idea that, you know what, oh, God's mad at me. God's punishing me for something. And if God was after you about something, you'd know. Okay? He doesn't, he's not that kind of father that just spanks us and doesn't tell. I remember there was times 
I love my dad. I love every memory of my dad. And I'm not saying that he wasn't justified. I, matter of fact, I will say this. I didn't get spanked nearly as much as I should have. And I'm probably pretty sure that you guys could amen that just by how I turned out. Thank you for nodding at that moment. Thank you. <laughs> not you. <laughs> but uh, there were times my dad spanked me. I had no idea why. Why am I getting spanked? I was too scared to ask. It seemed like every time I went to a certain place to get my hair cut, I would get spanked. When I got home, I got my hair cut. So I, don't, I don't know. I didn't get spanked very often, but God's not like that. He's not going to spank us and not tell us why he's spanking. Okay, so if, if he, it is, you'll know. Okay, but <laughs> let's go to number four. Number four. God didn't do the bad stuff. It wasn't God that did the bad stuff, but he allowed it. Okay, the devil was the one that pulled all this stuff off, but he allowed it, obviously. He also could have stopped it. But he didn't. So, there should be comfort in that, to know that God will not allow things in our lives that he doesn't first okay or this, that it, it, it's always for a purpose. He did stop Satan. He said, he's only praising you because you won't take his health away. He goes, okay, do that. Go ahead. He goes, but don't kill him. I'm not going to allow you to do that. And you've heard, probably heard people say this before, that nothing, come, no, nothing comes to us that doesn't first pass through God's hands or something in that effect that God does. But he didn't do it, but he allowed it. I don't know. I wrote this down. Why? I don't know. But then I wrote this. I may not know why, but I do know this. Brings me to number five. God uses us and works in our lives in ways that are not always pleasant. I know when we think about being used of God or God using us or working in our lives, we're always kind of looking towards it in a way that's positive or hoping it to be. But that's not the case. It's not always the case. be honest with you, it's not usually the case. I, I think about this, this conversation. Who, where was it? Oh, I can't remember the names. When Saul of Tarsus, when God appeared to him, when Jesus appeared to him and saved him, and then I think it was Cornelius, fellow that he sent to go see Paul, and he says, I want you to go talk to him. He said, I've already basically saved him. He says, and I've showed him how he must suffer. I was like, what? I, I, I don't know what all that was. But man, we like to think of our Christian life as being like all pleasant and stuff. But really, when Jesus said, any man that come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. He says, you understand that this is a life of suffering. It's not ease. God uses us and works in our lives in ways that are not always pleasant. I wrote this down, this thought of the illustration of the potter. The potter and the clay how he softens the clay. Okay, you ever watch anybody soften clay? They'll use water and they'll pound it. <laughs> Just smash it. You know, soften it, work it. And then he squishes it, tries to squish it to get it so that it's in a, in a position where it can be moldable. And then he sets it, after he's got the vessel molded, he sets it in the furnace. Now, if you were that clay, none of that sounds fun. That's kind of the illustration of how God works in our lives. You know, it's not always pleasant, but it's for a purpose. Matter of fact, it was Job that said this in, ver in chapter 23, verse 10. He says, He knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Number six. Um... I talk about the middle part of the book and how much that bothers me or has bothered me in the past because you read it and you think, what do I take out of this? You know, you're reading about what, you know, the stuff that Job says and it was some good stuff and then stuff that his friends say and some of it was good and some of it wasn't so good, but it's like, how do you sort this out? Or why is it even in here? 
And I come away with this, and this is a really, really dumbed down version, but this is a herald uh, from the mind of Harold. Again, this is my Job description. It's like, what do I get out of that? And I come away with this. Number six, you can't completely trust what people say. They might mean well and have good intentions and even say some good stuff. But we're all flawed and incomplete in our thinking. I say that because, you know, anything, anything that any man says, me, sermons, books, commentaries, you understand that that's all from man's perspective, right? Now, again, there's some good stuff that those guys said. But it's really, really hard to sort that out because you could easily take some of those verses where those guys are saying things and take them out of context. I probably should have come up with some illustrations of that, but there's some stuff where you could just take what they say and say, well, this, the Bible says this. No, <laughs> it does, but it, not, you're going to think about who's saying it. Men are, we're just flawed. Ah. <sighs> I know a lot of times, and I've said this before, and you'll hear me say it again. Come upon a passage of Scripture you don't understand. One of the first things that we want to do is run to a commentary and see what it says. Now, there's nothing wrong with looking at commentaries, but the first place we should go would be to the Lord. The, actually, the best place, the Bible, I, the Bible says, I've heard, I heard somebody say this years ago, and it's true. The more I think about it, the more I try to practice it, the more I find out that it is true, that the best interpreter of the Bible is the Bible. The Bible interprets itself. You just got to keep reading. And that's basically the point in this, because you can't sort out this stuff. If you just stop reading in the middle of this with these guys' conversation and not read the rest, because God really kind of sorts it out at the end. And that's kind of this whole book. You just keep reading. Let me just read you what I wrote down. Um, we can't trust everything that people say, but we can trust God. He'll help us sort it all out if we're really looking to Him. Now you say, wait! How can I trust the Bible at all if we can't trust this part? Again, you can, but it fits in the context. You have to read the whole thing. Scripture interprets Scripture. You can't completely trust what people say. Always keep that in the back of your mind. I love the passage. We were talking about this a couple weeks ago when I was over at Ruth's about when Paul, even Paul, the Apostle Paul, and I believe it was Silas was with him at that time, and they were preaching, and it says that they were in Berea, and it says that the people of Berea checked up on everything that they said. They went and they searched the Scriptures to see if what those guys said was so. They were using the Bible, the Old Testament, all they had at the time, as being their standard. It wasn't like, okay, well, these guys said that, and they look pretty cool, and they seem pretty genuine, so we're going to believe what they say. They're like, you know what? It sounds good, but we need to check it with this. Because we can't really totally, completely trust what people say. Number seven. With all of that in mind, and whatever you're going through, and whatever life throws your way, just know this. You're never going to be able to figure it all out ever, whether it be on a global scale, a national scale, or just your house, or even what's going on in your own life personally. You're never going to be able to figure it all out. We can't. When God spoke up to Job in those couple of chapters, one of the things that you could take away from this was basically God told Job, I could explain it to you, why and how I do things, but you still wouldn't understand. I love it. I love the first chapter where God's speaking where he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the universe? What were you doing when this happened and this happened? And, and how would you do this? And how about I just, and there's one part where he goes, how about I just let you be God for a day? See if you can keep everything together. And you want to question me? And the Bible says that Job's like, you're right, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm not done. <laughs> and he keeps these basic, but in so many words, at one point he goes, I can explain it to you, but you still wouldn't understand. We're never going to figure it all out, ever. So why do we try? Which brings me to number eight. We're not called to understand. We're called to trust. To trust. <sighs> 
even in what seems like the most, I mean, you look at Job. I've had some rough days. I've never had a day like that where I literally lost everything, my whole family, my health, all that stuff. And he still trusted God. We're not called to understand. We're called to trust. Number nine. You're not going to believe this. I am, okay, I told you there was ten. That means there's only two left. Jim says, I'm not going to get my hopes up. <laughs> I know the last point is going to take 45 minutes. <laughs> One thing I get from the book of Job, it's all going to work out in the end. I'm not saying that whatever we're going through is going to have a happy ending, but in a sense, I am. In this perspective, Job's doing pretty well right now. Oh yeah, Job still exists. He's doing pretty good. I, <laughs> I used to think at the end, you know, when it says that he ends up, that God gave him twice as much as he had before. And it goes on and it tells everything that he got, all the cows and whatever it was he got, and he had twice as much. But then it says he gave him ten kids again. And I thought, that's not twice as many. That's still the same. How come he didn't give him 20 kids? And then I realized, wait a minute, right now, Job is surrounded by 20 kids. He didn't lose those kids. They just got relocated. You know, so he did have twice as many kids when it was all said and done. He didn't, he lost all those cows. He's not with those. I'm not going to tell you that your pets aren't in heaven. <laughs> I'm not going there. I hope they are. But pretty good, pretty good that I don't think your chickens are going to be there. Okay. <laughs> They are, it's because we need them for food. <laughs> Let's move on, Harold. But <laughs> at, the end, at the end of their life, do you don't eat chickens, Jimmy? No. <laughs> I think there's a song. I should write a song. Chickens in heaven. <laughs> Shut up. Um, so anyway. <laughs> What was I saying? I forgot. Oh, it all works out to end. Um, so you think about this, man. You ever think about something that you're going through and just take a step back? I got this weird hair that's just. Just take a step back and think that 200, 200 years from now, the stuff that we're going through is not going to seem like such a big deal. You know, if the Lord was to come back and call us out of here, like, I don't care, the darkest day that you could ever imagine, and all of a sudden the Lord snatch you out of here in the rapture. Be like, bye. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you better waking up in heaven. All the stuff that we, we're so used to, to, to being all brought down by and being depressed by and being worried about and waking up in heaven one day and just realizing that <laughs> I don't have to worry about that anymore. I had, a, I had a dream the other night. I might have told you. Since, uh, now, I don't know exactly what Beth told you, Sandy, but Beth did say, Sandy alluded to the idea that Beth said, you've got to stay on him because he's clueless and he's going to forget. <laughs> so I've been getting texts like every day from Sandy. Now remember, we're getting married here. <laughs> it's like, okay, okay, yeah, I'm not that clueless, but, you know. <laughs> but I have forgotten things. I had a dream that I was doing a wedding and I couldn't find my little notebook. Now you have to understand that if I don't have my little notebook to do a wedding, I got problems because I got to just start making up vows off the top of my head. Um, I promise that I'm not going to leave you or do anything stupid. I'll make my bed. I'll uh, help you wash dishes. Uh, and the guy would be looking at me like, what? <laughs> That's my vow? <laughs> That's all I got, dude. So I, I had a dream that I was doing a wedding and I couldn't find it. I couldn't find my notebook. Well, then I was looking around, looking around, and I went in my bedroom, and there it was. But I was really tired. And so apparently I laid down, because next thing I knew, I woke up. Now I'm, I'm sleeping and waking up in my dream, and I'm like, oh no, I'm doing a wedding. And I was like, ah, what? And then I woke up, 
I mean, it was horrifying. When you're a pastor, that's a horrifying dream. You're not with me right now. You're not feeling my pain and my horror. But I woke up, for real, I woke up, and I'm like, hey, that was just a dream. I don't have to worry about that. My little heart was going, but 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 you know. <laughs> but you're going, to, wow. You're like, this is the stupidest illustration ever. Waking up in heaven and realizing, obviously this wasn't all a dream, but in a sense, you realize heaven is more real than anything that we've ever experienced here because this is all going to turn to dust one day and heaven is eternal and someday I'm going to get to heaven and all the stuff that I'm so stressed about here is going to be gone, going to be history. And it'll be like, for the first time ever, it'll be like, <sighs> I'm free. I don't have anything to worry about ever again. <laughs> I, I'm so looking forward to it. I, I have this image, this vision. I wasn't planning on going there. But I remember as a kid, you know how your parents would do something like this? Now, we weren't rich by any stretch, you know, my mom and dad, but my mom always saw to it that we had a really nice Christmas. But I look back on our presents. You know, I watch my grandkids now and open their stuff. I mean, everything they get is like a big present. You know, I mean, it's like billions of dollars under the tree. You know, you look at their stuff, and it's like, holy cow. When I was a kid, you know, you'd open stuff like socks. You know, I mean, that, that was cool. And, you know, you wouldn't, as a kid, you know, like, hey, hey, socks. Uh, you know, you know, or candy, and that was cool. You know, hey, candy, yeah. But they'd always save, like, this one present, but they'd make it, act. sometimes they'd even hide that one big present, you know. And you'd be like, that was nice. They, oh, wait, oh, I forgot. There's another one. They'd go bring it out. And this one would like, <laughs> it was like, this, oh, how did you know I want? Well, you've been talking about it every day since you were born. But, you know, it's like, oh, thank you. And the look in my mom's eyes would be like, she would get as much or more joy out of it than I would. And I'm wondering, get to heaven, that, that look in Jesus' eyes would be like, told you. You know, I told you. Because you're going to look around and be like, oh, wow. <laughs> it's all going to work out one way or another. I get that from the book of Job. There's one other thing, and this is a little bit different. And this is where I said earlier on that this is kind of the thing where I kind of was toying with three different titles for this. Um... My Job description, obviously, was just a mess play on words there, sort of. Not very clever, but my other title was this. this called, we call this the Book of Job. I mentioned this earlier, that we don't really know who wrote it. There's some thinking that it might have been Moses. I don't think it was Job himself. It could have been. We don't know. But ultimately, it was God that authored the book. So who actually put pen to paper, we don't know. It doesn't really matter. Um, but I thought, what if there was a book of Harold? <laughs> or a book of you? What if there was a book of you? What would God say about you? What would that look like? Uh, I've got to be honest with you. I almost called this again. This was almost one of my titles. The Book of You. What would that look like? <clears throat> if I had anything even remotely close... No, I, I can't even go there. I'm telling you, <clears throat> the Book of Me would and should be banned. Okay. You don't want to read that book. All right. I look at this and I think about Job and how he responded to this kind of stuff. That's not me. Um, oh. let, me, let me just read you what I wrote. <clears throat> oh, I have another title. I'll throw it at you in a second. I wrote, uh, what if God published the, published the book of you? Uh, what would that read like? And I said, man, you might be thinking, man, I'm glad my stuff ain't in the book, in the Bible. I wouldn't want anybody to read that. But you are being read. People are watching you. 
People know that you go to church, you claim to be a Christian, whatever. People are reading you. People are watching. Let me read you one thing in here about somebody that we don't know really anything about except this one thing. Here it was in chapter 2, in verse 7, it says, So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he, Job, took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all. So he's, and he sat down among the ashes. I have that phrase underlined. He sat down among the ashes. That was all that was left of his life, of his world, was just ashes. And now he's scraping boils. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. <clears throat> That's the only thing we know about his wife. That's the only thing we hear her say, the only thing we know. Now, she was probably a good woman. They raised good kids. But all we... <laughs> I'm looking forward to meeting Job. Imagine meeting him. Dude, that must have really sucked. <laughs> yeah. Let me introduce you to my wife. Oh, hi. Oh, you're the one that said, because you want to say to Job, dude, I have no idea. How did you, you were awesome. Man, I mean, I read, wow. And then you meet her and be like, oh, you're the one that, I'm pretty sure she's not going to go, yeah, I said that. Yeah, I'm pretty proud of that. No, I don't think she's pretty proud of that. But that's all we remember of her. And I'll be honest with you, I almost titled this message, Curse God and die. <laughs> that's awful. That's awful. But that's the only thing we know about this woman. That's the only thing we heard her say. We don't know nothing else about her life. But that's the thing that stands out. I wonder how many times in my life I've responded or reacted in a wrong way and somebody heard me. I gotta be honest with you, and I'm going there, and uh, I mentioned this the other day. You know, Ed was helping me with the car, and I make jokes about this, and they're not totally just jokes. I said, I'm glad you're not here. You keep me from cussing. I don't know what it is about working on cars. That's one of, I, there's a lot of things that get to me, but nothing gets to me faster than that. All right, I can, I'll be working on something, and I'll be trying, and then something will go wrong. You'll snap a bolt. You'll do something. And I'm telling you, stuff starts flying. Tools. I've got tools in other countries that I've thrown. I just... How many times... It's a joke amongst my kids, but it's really not funny. How many times they saw me get mad working on a car. would we'll be broke down along somewhere, and I'll just show myself. And I wonder if it didn't at least cross their minds. Dad preaches about trust in God. But something goes wrong and this is how he acts. We're being read. What would the book of you look like? Now, I'll be honest with you, and here's something I didn't even think about saying this, but it's like, oh boy, because I don't want to leave you just kind of hanging, going, okay, well, that's great, and I'm just going to walk out of here with nothing but regrets and think about all the stupid stuff I did. How do we fix it? Be honest with you, this book, the book of Job, could have turned out entirely different if it didn't end well. Okay, what's the best part? It's the way it ends, not just what happened to him, but how he responded, especially at the end. I'll be honest with you, if my friends would have showed up, whoever those friends are, and they'd have sitting there and my whole life was just taken away from me in a day like this and they'd have sat there for a while, I bet you would first thing would have come out of my mouth finally would have been like, anybody bring any whiskey? I need to get drunk. Because in my heart I'd be like, God, are you serious? I've been faithful to you my whole life. And you treat me like this? What did I do? I didn't do anything. And I'd want to just get mad at him and just walk away. That's not the way he acted. 
He did think back about some of his regrets and some of the things that he thought because he was reflecting. But it was all said and done. It, he finished well. I think it depends an awful lot on our last chapters. Okay? So, this idea again of this book of Job kind of relating to the book of us. Oh, we can look back and think about all the stuff and have questions and think about all the regrets that we've got in our own lives. But I say, how about if we just finish our books well? Anyway, there it is. Heavenly Father God, I do thank you, Lord, again for your love and mercies to us. Lord, I know I didn't even scratch the surface of everything that's in that book. But, Lord, some of these... I just thank you for some of the reminders and the lessons, Lord, that you give to me. And especially, Lord, just this kind of this sobering thought of the fact that not only do you see everything that we do, both good and bad, but, Lord, that uh, people see stuff too. God, I pray, God, that you help us as we kind of live in out our books. <laughs> God, that we'll kind of keep all that in mind. God, help us. Help us. Help us to be faithful. Help us to trust you. Lord, help us. With our heads bowed, a couple questions. <clears throat> maybe here this morning, maybe the Lord put something specifically, finger on something specifically in your life that needs to be addressed. Or maybe it's just a little bit of encouragement, just a reminder that, oh, you know what? Ultimately, God's in control. I mean, we might not understand it, and we don't have to understand it. But whatever it is, you say, you know what? The Lord spoke to me in some way, and I need prayer. I need prayer. Yes, yes, yes. Just put your hand up, put it right back down. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. One more question. I ask this every Sunday. <clears throat> Didn't really talk about this, but it's pretty important. Here's the question. If you were to die today, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? You can know. The Bible even says, it says, These things are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. The Lord wants us to know. But if you don't know, there's no shame in that. In fact, that's where it all begins, by coming to the realization. It's like, you know what, I'm, I don't know. If you don't know for sure, with nobody looking, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to just put your hand up and put it right back down. I'm not going to have you stand or come forward or anything. This is just between you, me, and God. Just put your hand up, put it right back down, and say, you know what, I'm, I'm not sure. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me that I'll get it settled before it's too late. Pray for me. Father, again, Lord, we thank you for your goodness. I pray now that you'll bless these closing moments. In Jesus' name, amen.